social movements and party politics, inherently at odds or natural allies. This week, in his first in-depth TV appearance, Maurice Mitchell, the new national director of the Working Families Party, joins me in studio to discuss his activist background, the party's national and international vision, and how the organization is tackling this midterm election year. It's all just ahead on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. After the 2016 elections, defeated but newly energized progressive voters around the country vowed to win back power from the right. Grab them by the midterm, said some of the signs at last year's Women's March. Vote them out, was the rallying cry at the more recent March for Our Lives. The 2018 midterms coming up will be a major test of the strength of what has been dubbed the resistance. The Working Families Party is in the midst of all of this, an independent party formed by unions, activists, and advocates in the late 1980s. The WFP recently welcomed a new national director who embodies its belief in the convergence of social movement with electoral strategy. Maurice Mo Mitchell has worked as a community organizer for years, including in Ferguson and with the Movement for Black Lives. I am very happy to welcome him to the show. Maurice, welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm not clear whether to start with you or start with the party, but I think because so many people are unfamiliar with the party in many of our states, yes. where it doesn't really exist, mm -hmm. that we should start there. Tell sure. us what the Working Families Party is, how you operate, and then we'll get to why the heck you're heading it up. Uh, absolutely. So I think one of the most simple ways I could describe the Working Families Party is that we're a political party um, that's dead in the same way that the Republicans and the Democrats are rooted in and dedicated to corporate issues and often side with a, a, a set of corporate values. We side with a set of values of working people. And our party is a combination of grassroots organizations and unions that make up a number of various sectors of, of, uh, of working people around the country. And also movements, increasingly movements. And so when the rubber hits the road and we have to make a hard decision, um, we call on our base, working people, grassroots organization fighting for everyday sort of bread and butter issues on the front line around um, issues like police violence, on the front line like issues like uh, immigration. We call on them yeah. when we have to make tough decisions. Oftentimes, people in some of the mainstream parties, they call on their corporate backers. You don't make, just call up your, phones, your friends on Wall Street. Right, right. <laughs> so in New York, when I go to vote, Working Families is listed there. That's right. Um, and I can vote for your candidates. I can vote for Democrats that your candidates, that, that you, the party has uh, endorsed or supported. Mm -hmm. um, but in lots of the countries, that's not the case. Sure. Describe how you actually work in terms of electing people, gaining power, gaining influence. Yeah, by many means, by many means. So in states like New York, where there's fusion voting, and I won't get into the details of it, where we actually have a party line, um, we're able to endorse people, and then you as a voter, you could actually vote on the working families line, right? And so that's a strategy that works in those states. And other states... So just to elaborate, so it enables you to vote for, say, a Democrat, even that may not exactly be where your heart is, but you don't want that person to lose, on your line and indicate to that person you're coming to that vote through your lens and with your sets of principles. Right, right. Voting on the working families' lines says that we're rooted in a, a set of ideals, a set of values, and we often cross-endorse people who um, are on other lines. So we may cross-endorse a Democrat. Um, we, we, we also, during primaries, we primary Democrats as well. Um, uh, but 
it, you could vote for the same person that you might vote for on the Democratic line, but on the working families line. And then collectively, we demonstrate that we have power and that we can use that as a way to provide leverage, to hold people accountable, and then also to support people after elections. And you do run your own candidates. That's right. We run our own working families candidates. Um, we don't run in every single race. We, we uh, try to choose our fights, and we try to choose the terrain that we, that we want to fight on, the, the issue terrain and the, the uh, policy terrain. Um, and we try to elect, we try to run people who really align with our values. Mm. So when we're electing and we're supporting a working families person, our base, our communities know that that person is a true fighter. That person is not led by corporate values. And um, how many states are you active in? So we're in um, more than a dozen. We're in around 16 states um, and we're growing. Um, and one of my mandates as the new national director is to get to all 50 states. And I'm super excited about that mandate. I, I, I have a vision where we will have a presence in every state, in every county. Um, and the larger our base is, the, the bigger our presence, the more we could fight. All right, so let's talk about you. I mean, when I say, why the heck are you heading up this party? It's like you were doing a lot of movement organizing. That's right. You were really active. Tell me more about it. Yeah. Um, but you've made this very big decision to come and head up, well, I would call it an electoral organization, but maybe you wouldn't. Well, um, I'm glad you... You know, I want to complicate Good. how people understand electoral organization. So tell us about you. Sure. So I'm a longtime organizer. Um, I'd like to the way that I like people to understand my my politics is rooted in my my family's history. My family are immigrants. My grandmother was a domestic worker who came to this country. And from very, very early on, I learned all of the political values that I would employ later on in life, just at the kitchen table, just experiencing the immigrant hustle, just being a young black person in the United States dealing with the criminal justice system. Um, and I grew a, a fire in my belly to resolve these contradictions. And that led me to organizing in, in all these different spaces. As a student, um, I started organizing against police brutality in prisons. And then for many years, I organized in New York State on a number of issues, um, educational issues, uh, educational equity, uh, economic inequality. Um, and then um, when Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson, um, I, as well as many other people, um, it really converged in, in that moment in order to support folks on the ground there and support other folks around the country um, in what later became the Movement for Black Lives. And for the past four years, I've been a movement leader in the Movement for Black Lives, creating the infrastructure um, to create a aligned but decentralized movement with many leaders. Um, and I've had the honor of witnessing so many young black folks around the country really emerge as leaders in their community, building new organizations, um, you know, uh, changing the way our conversation around race and anti-black violence, and also having this now an international conversation um, Around around the state of Black people. So now you're heading up a 30-year-old organization. That's right, that's right. Um, and so I, I, the reason why I'm here is, you know, during 2016, um, in the run-up to the 2016 elections, um, folks in movement were having a lot of conversations around what is our relationship to electoral politics, to governance. We've built this outside power, yeah. right? And what, we, what we've been really effective at doing is, is building outside power to the point where the ruling class feels a sense of crisis. And that crisis has to be resolved. Now, unfortunately, what happens if you only build outside power, you create this crisis and you create this tension that needs to be resolved. And then on the other side, organized forces, corporate forces could resolve it. So, create this tension around the murder of black people in the streets by police officers. And then the corporate response is body cameras, right? Um, and then Taser International, a corporation gets all of these contracts in order to resolve this, yeah. this, this crisis, right? And so- Not in the way you would have intended. Absolutely. And so if we don't contend with governing, if we don't contend with t taking power, both economic and political power, as well as, as developing the, the protest power, yeah. um, will continue to sort of 
pose these questions that ultimately get answered by our opponents. There's also the phenomenon of during the 2016 primaries, we saw, we saw people from the Movement for Black Lives pushing Democrats. That's right. To address race. That's right. And that was unsatisfying too. Yeah, I, it, was unsat it was unsatisfying because, again, we were only able to push people who actually weren't rooted in our values and our communities um, a little bit around uh, the way around race. I think we're really effective in, in making our issues a, a front and center issue mm. in the debate, but still it was unsatisfying. Mm. And then ultimately with, um, with the election of, of Donald Trump and his whole movement, I think many of us um, took a step back and took this question of governance even more seriously. Also of issues after the election, we had that same old familiar debate we've had a million times of, well, we should never have talked about race, we should just focus right. on class. When did that begin? When, when did class get so divorced from race in our discourse? And let's throw gender and everything else in there. I've always yeah. wondered, how did we end up with social issues and economic issues? It's not one or the other when it's affecting my body. Yeah, absolutely not. And. Uh, I, I feel really passionately about this. And for the, past, for the past four years in the movement for Black Lives, one of the interventions we wanted to make is that we're an intersectional movement, right? And so I don't experience something, things as only as a black person, or only as a son of immigrants, or it's, you know, I have a very complex and layered identity. And so that's how people actually experience their lives. Now, when it comes to party politics, um, this false debate, needs to be resolved between economic inequality, resolving that, um, and changing our, um, fundamentally changing the power dynamics in our economy, creating economy for all, and racial justice, and make sh making sure that people of color um, are in every way full citizens and fully are able to access our democracy, that black folks mm -hmm. are able to fully access our democracy. Those two things go hand in hand are, and actually, um, you know, there's a term called racial capitalism because, because people understand historically how things like the genocide of Native people and the transatlantic slave trade and the capture of African people, how that um, historically had everything to do with the development of capitalism. And so if we want to resolve these, these contradictions and these sore spots in, in our economic system, we need to deal with racial justice. And also, if we want to resolve these fundamental questions around race, we need to deal with, with economic justice. Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the president of Haiti, once said that the elections just take the temperature of the democracy. They're not the democracy. If That's you right. were to take the temperature of the Working Families Party now, like yeah. where you're at, mm -hmm. um, and we're speaking at the beginning of the summer season mm -hmm. of 2018 and the run-up to the um, midterms, um, where would you say we're at? What are you excited about, and yeah. um, where are you pushing? What I'm excited about um, is... I feel like we're in unprecedented times and we're in a time of a volatile time, right? And during times of volatility, there's, there's just great opportunity, right? If we seize it. So I think it's a question. If we seize this opportunity where, you know, we have all of these new movements that have, that have come about in the past few years, um, the movement of, of dreamers and immigrants, the movement, uh, the movement for black lives, um, the Never Again movement around gun violence, the Women's March, right? So an unprecedented sort of culture shift in how people relate to their democracy. That is, that is also a indicator of where our democracy is at. And at the same time, especially with millennials and young people, lower and lower party affiliation. Because people are finding a hard time sort of associating with these two very corporate entities. One is a center-right party, the other is a far-right proto-fascist proto party, right? And people have a desire, have a hunger for something different. They want an electoral expression of these movements. And they've been finding some good people to vote for in the primaries. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, people like Stacey Abrams, you know. Um, the, the Democratic gubernatorial candidate in Georgia. Yes, and we're super excited about her race. Um, you know, we've endorsed her and, you know, we have people on the ground. Um, in Georgia. And another aside around that is the collaboration that's happening around amazing visionary leaders like Stacey. So it's not just us in Georgia, it's a whole coalition of forces. Um, and so I, if I were to take the temperature, I think that this is a, a moment of great opportunity um, 
for people of goodwill, for people on the left, and for the party um, to be a political home for, for people who have those values that, you know, where you have to kind of like hold your nose and make that strategic vote, but you feel funny about it. We want to create a political home where you can feel really proud about it. And I think this is a great time where, where participation is growing, but party affiliation is, is declining. In that, in that sweet spot, that's where the Working Families Party, I think, could really be ascended. Shout out to people who haven't heard of Stacey Abrams yet. Mm -hmm. And why is it so significant what just happened in Georgia? So the Stacey Abrams race is so significant because Stacey Abrams is a true progressive, a true fighter. She's been committed since a young person around these values. This isn't something she just stepped, stepped into. Um, and she built a grassroots movement led by black women. So I, I always say one of my political one of my political philosophies is trust black women. Stacey Abrams is a leader, a principled leader um, that created this amazing electoral, grassroots electoral uh, movement around her race. She would be the first black woman governor in the history of the United States when she wins. Um, and so she ran a insurgent uh, primary uh, and won, won and blew it out the water, I think, you know, past 70% of the vote. And to me, this is an example of our values. This is an example of, of um, aligning with out, outsiders that, you know, the, the mainstream would never consider. Um, you know, right now there's this fight that's taking place where a lot of these outside candidates, many of them women, are being challenged by the DCCC and others to get out of the races because, um, you know, the, the Democrats are so concerned with fl uh, flipping Congress that they rather have you know, middle of the road. They're still committed to these, like, you know, white guy veterans and, you know, and uh, small business people, that sort of strategy. The Democratic and, camp Congressional Campaign Committee. Yeah, and um, we believe that when you find uh, somebody who's authentic, who's rooted in their community, who has real values, you'll develop a movement around them that'll take them over the edge. And we saw that with Stacey Abrams, and I couldn't be more excited. Now, as much as you make yourself clear, you've also been getting some help from the establishment mm -hmm. in distinguishing you from others. That's right. When the Working Families Party went out on a limb and endorsed an insurgent contest, a, a competitor mm -hmm. in the um, gubernatorial race in New York, yeah. Cynthia Nixon, the actress, running against Andrew Cuomo, mm -hmm. um, Cuomo lashed out That's in right. a way that spoke volumes, it seems to me, about the fear of the establishment. Um, tell me and our audience what happened. There were threats. Sure, sure. And, and what you made of that. Yeah, I mean, I think for Albany insiders have known for years um, that Cuomo sort of r runs the, the Democratic Party and the politics of New York like a, like a boss, right? Like it's like a Tammany Hall type of uh, character. But this was sort of like an inside story. And um, we dared to disobey him. Um, by primary him. Um, and, you know, the tension is, like, you know, there's so many, so many layers to the story, but I think the, the important thing for your viewers to understand is that um, Cuomo took that, that insult of us being an independent party and choosing uh, to endorse somebody else. Um, he's now taking it, he's taken it upon himself to attempt to destroy the party. Um, and attempt to isolate us. What form has that taken? He's bullied many of our partners in labor, uh, who we've worked closely with for decades, um, to pull their support from us. He's bullied elected officials um, to pull their support from us and not to align with us. Um, and he's, trust me, every day I'm sure there's a war room where there's some space where that says WFP, where he's coming up with all types of really underhanded strategies to either dilute our political power, to defame us, to discredit us, um, because he wants to make an example out of us that you do not disobey him in, now, in New York State. there are people watching that are of the belief that it is a distraction mm -hmm. in a tight-fought race to be throwing up a, a, a primary challenge. Ah. Um, and at the same time, Cynthia Nixon's candidacy does seem to have had a positive impact on Cuomo. Sure. Is that your goal? Uh, we, have a, we have a number of goals. We're really excited about Cynthia. But one of, the, one of the things that happens when you support a visionary 
non-corporate candidate is that they say the things that we actually believe, the things often you'll never hear from a traditional candidate. So, you know, I was in Harlem and Cynthia gave a, gave a speech and talked about the fact that gentrification was a colonial <laughs> a colonial expression that we need to really challenge, right? That's not anything you're going to hear from a corporate Democrat. And Cynthia came out um, for Medicaid for All, um, for um, legalizing marijuana. And then as, as soon as she moves in a certain direction, Cuomo desperately yeah. moves further left. So we're moving the center of politics in New York State left as Cynthia runs. And the fears that people have that you'll be de detracting from the chances of the Democrat winning? Listen, I, I think those fears are so unfounded. And if we rely on fear, that's one of the reasons why we're at where we are in our country. So right? those fears get diminished when you share them. Um, mm -hmm. And I happen to know you just came back from Barcelona. That's right. Um, where a lot of people have be fi are fighting similar fights yeah. um, across Europe, in fact. Mm -hmm. To what extent are you working with allies and colleagues in other countries, and to what end? Yeah, so that's another thing that really excites me. I have a number of mandates um, as I take on this mantle. One of them is international internationalizing our perspective and also building meaningful relationships with left parties around the world that are interested in these fights. Because everything that we're dealing with in the United States, the rise of right-wing populism, the rise of um, white supremacists, um, sort of gentrification on the municipal level, all those things, people are dealing with that in, in countries around the world. And so it just makes sense to be in conversation with our partners in other places as they develop solutions. And then we could exchange ideas, we, we could exchange different practices, um, and we could build a coalition the same way that the right wing internationally is building deep. If people remember Steve Bannon, you know, he went on tour in Europe. And so in the same way that the, the, the far right is building this international coalition, we need to be strategic and internationalize our perspective, internationalize our relationships, and internationalize our, our politics. And so the Working Families Party is, in the next few years, going to engage with, you know, folks in the UK that are doing interesting things, folks in Spain. Uh, there's parties around the world. There's parties in Latin America, and there's movements in Africa. Uh, I was just in South Africa for a month. Uh, that are really exciting, doing really groundbreaking things, and working on these issues, you know, working on gentrification, working on, on land rights, working on what's the commons, like what, what, exactly, yeah. is, what exactly is a right or isn't a right, right? And so these are, these are not just parochial American issues, and if we see them as, as those, then it kind of limits our perspective and, and the, the power that we could have if we align internationally. So Barcelona and Comun, a very clear commitment to the commons. Yeah. Um, a, a radical new imagining of who the economy works for and, uh, and, and how it could be restructured to actually serve the people. Yeah. Um, I have an associated the Working Families Party with a transformational economic vision. Mm -hmm. um, is that part of your mandate too? Absolutely, absolutely. There, I mean, and this is something that I saw in, in South Africa. Um, political power without economic power um, is hollow. And so if we don't figure out how to democratize our, uh, our economy at the same time that we fight for a real, a real uh, democracy um, in terms of our elections and everything else, then, um, then we're ceding that space to corporations. And so we actually need a, a radical restructuring of our economy. And that's, that's a conversation that um, none of, no corporate candidate has the appetite for. And this is this by which we mean not just tinkering with the tax code or re resisting cuts, but actually reorganizing. Yes, yes. That's where the rubber hits the road. I think, you know, if, if anybody wants to understand the difference between us and Democrats, for example, it's, you're going to see it around economic policy, right? Um, you know, there's people who believe that, um, you know, the economy may not be working for everybody, but a gradual strategy of tinkering around the edges to sort of reform the current state of the economy is the way to go. We take a different perspective. We think we actually have to restructure. There's something fundamentally wrong with this economy and requires a fundamental restructuring for people to, to be able to fully step into and participate in it.
Thank you so much. It was really fabulous having you with us in the studio. Thank you.